Welcome to the next sociology video. This one is about sampling. Sampling is just essentially the people who you survey or question when conducting social research. There's some key terms that we need to get to grips with. When we're talking about the whole population, we're talking about everybody within a society. And the target population are the specific people that you want to research. So, for instance, if I was to do some research about sixth formers, it'd be no good asking um, people in their 40s. It's the target population is sixth formers. The sampling frame is the list of people from whom the sociologist chooses their sample. So it might be a list of all the sixth formers at George Stevenson High School, for instance. However, that would be quite a big number of people to do their research on. So what I would do is then pick a smaller group of people and they would become my sample. The picture shows this quite neatly. Um, so target population is everyone within America. Who do you get? Uh, what population can you get access to? So this is the people that you want to actually study. The sampling frame is the people is about how you can access people. So, for instance, you might use the telephone book, and then from that you get your sample, which is the people that you ask the questions of. So, one more example before we move on. You want to compare the memories of left-handed and right-handed high school students. So, the whole population is everyone within society. The target population are students who are in high school. The sampling frame, because I work at George, I might ask students at George. And then from that, I will pick perhaps 50 left-handed students and 50 right-handed students and compare and contrast their memories. So those are the key terms that we need to know for talking about sampling, particularly the three that I've underlined. However, there's different ways of actually getting a sample from the sampling frame. The, these sampling Sampling techniques are largely dependent upon whether or not the sociologist wants a representative sample of the target population. Representative means that a sample fairly reflects the population in terms of social characteristics, such as gender, age and class, and which, if large enough, would allow the sociologist to make generalisations from their results. That is to say that the findings or results can be applied to other people in a similar situation or social group. So that word again is representative, okay? If a sociologist is wanting representative data, the chances are that they're a positivist. We already know that positivists believe that sociology is a science and that they're looking for reliability. This means that they use random sampling techniques. This uses probability to draw... Um, to draw you, that shouldn't say draw you, to draw a representative sample. Interpretivists are more concerned with validity, so they're not necessarily bothered about having a sample from which generalisations can be made to apply to everyone, because they're looking at small-scale interactions between different people. They'll use different techniques where there might not be a, a sampling frame available. So a sociologist who is a, a positivist might use something like the telephone book to get a sample. However, interpretivists, because they're researching small groups of people, there might not be a specific list of people for the research that they're doing. But we'll come on to that in a little bit. So, there are three different um, probability techniques. Um, and the first one is simple random sampling. Uh, it's sometimes known as SRS. Okay, and simple random sampling generally just involves selecting a number of sample people from the sample um, at random. It can be done by a computer, it could be done drawing names out of the hat. The second type is systematic random sampling, and this is where you pick every nth name from a list. So, for instance, say I was uh, looking at six formers and their attitudes towards a certain thing, I might pick every third person on a register, like here. So, one, two, three, person three joins the sample. If large enough, both of these sampling techniques would be representative of the target population. However, we can't account, well, we can't guarantee this because sometimes there is something which is called a freak sample, which is where, for reasons beyond the sociologist's control, the sample isn't that representative. 
still using random sampling, what the sociologists can do is what's called a stratified random sample. This involves dividing the population according to the number of people with the social characteristics required and then making a random sample from these subgroups. So for instance, say a teacher wanted to look at the performance of boys versus girls or the interactions of boys versus girls within a classroom. They would first of all perhaps split the boys and girls into two groups. And what we can see is that there's a large number of boys and a fewer number of girls. So they might work out the proportions between the two groups. So there's one girl to every two boys. So then that would mean that the sociologist, or the teacher in this case, would pick two girls. And if they were to pick two girls, then they would need to pick four boys to balance that out. And this way, they get a, they get a sample which is um, representative of the class. Perhaps if that sociologist had done a simple random sampling, they might have pulled out three girls' names, and that wouldn't necessarily reflect the gender difference within the class. So a stratified random sample is useful for that. Stratified generally just means splitting things into group. So we've got stratified random sampling here. Stratified random. Um, we've got systematic, which is this one up here. Systematic. And we have simple which is the SRS one, uh, simple. There's a sheet at the end of this, this video that's got lots of this information in that you might want to use um, when you're making your notes. So random sampling techniques are useful when no sampling frame is available or even appropriate. So, for instance, say you're researching crime, there's not necessarily the crime form book where you can ring up criminals from. Um, and even if they are, some sociologists don't really like using uh, sampling frames because it might not sort of mat It might not really help them with their research. So whilst positivists are concerned with the uh, with the generation of a representative sample, interpretivists are often less so. In relation to any of these situations, it's likely that the sample will then be a non-random one. And there are five different techniques of this. Um, of drawing a non-probability or non-random sample, quarter sampling, purposive volu uh, sampling, volunteer sampling and opportunity sampling. And I think I may have missed one out because I'm not sure I said five then. Oh, and snowball, okay. So the first type is quarter sampling. And quarter sampling is where you ask, uh, you have a specific list of people that you are to ask. So you might need to ask um, three males and three females. And you just... The first three people that come along who fit the quota um, would be asked the questions. Um, so then the second type, oh sorry, the quota sampling um, involves the sociologist making a decision about the number of people that they want um, from different social groups and then selecting them personally. The advantage of this is that the sociologist has quite a high level of control but the problem is, is they may choose people who look as if they fit a particular brief, but may not do. And this may cause their sample to be skewed or biased. So, for instance, say a person has a job of getting three people who are in their 30s and three people who are in their 40s and three people in their 50s. At first glance, they might not necessarily be able to tell which people are in their 30s, which people are in their 40s and which people are in their 50s. The second type of... Uh, non-random sampling is a snowball sample and a snowball sample is most often used when researching crime. Snowball sampling is a useful technique to use when access to a group is difficult and involves the sociologist finding one person they are interested in and asking them to then refer them on to people who might be willing to take part. So the reason why it's quite often used with gangs uh, with crime is that the sociologist will find one criminal who will then refer them on to other criminals. Whilst clearly useful where access is problematic, this approach could lead to the people in the sample being rather similar to one another. The next type is purposive sampling um, and this is a techni technique used by sociologists who are looking for particular people. So for example Hodkinson, so I'll just put purposive here, Hodkinson wanted to research goths so what he did was he went and found some goths and did some research on them. So it was just him going and asking people um, to find 
the sample that was going to give him the data that he wanted to collect. So I'll just put goths underneath. So we know. Um, so this can be used where a specific type of person is required. The next type of sampling is volunteer sampling. Um, and this is where people self-select. So people opt into being a research participant. And whilst this makes the data collection quite easy for the sociologist, the issue is, is that only one type of person may choose to take part. So, for example, if North Tyneside were to do a, um, a, um, some research about victims and crime, you might find that it's people like me who are annoyed about a locally committed crime, because someone stole my wheelie bin, um, who reply. And it might not be people who believe that there's not really any crime in North Tyneside. And the final type is called opportunity sampling. An opportunity sampling is where you just use the people who are nearest to hand. So you might use your friends and family. Um, and that's quite a popular one for sort of researching groups who are similar to the sociologist. Thinking about sampling, we've got this um, famous example of a sample that went wrong. So in 1936, the Literary Digest conducted a poll into who people were voting for in the US presidential election. The sample was a random sample using the telephone directory. So the telephone directory was a sampling frame and they asked over 2.4 million people. So you would imagine with a sample that large um, and it being a random sample that it would be representative. However, they predicted that the Republican candidate, Alf Landon, would win with 57% of the votes cast. However, it was the Democrat, Roosevelt, who won uh, with 62% of the vote. And sociologists looked at this and thought, well, what was it that went wrong? The problem was, was the sampling frame that the researchers used. In 1936, it was only the rich people who had telephones. So to be in the telephone directory, you've got to have a telephone. Rich people are more like, in America are more likely to vote Republican than they are Democrat. So it was only their votes which then... Um, were registered within this poll that the Literary Digest took. So when thinking about sampling, it's very important that we use this when we're talking about questionnaires and interviews and other forms of social research, because this can give us a clue to how data might not be particularly valid. So as I mentioned, I've put in here the, the notes about sampling. These are the notes about sampling, sorry. And you may want to have a look through these um, and read them before next lesson and make sure that you know what the different words are and what they mean. Remember, with this video, you might need to watch it more than once in order to understand it. But hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into sampling. Don't worry if there's anything that you don't understand because we'll be going through this in the lesson. Well done.